Welcome to the Easton Online Podcast. I'm your host, Elliot Marshall. And what this podcast is here to do, it's here to help you gain strategies and tactics and tools that are going to help you grow in your martial arts business. If you have a martial arts school, a gym, this is one of my passions is how we spread the message of how to really grow culture and business and and some ways that we do it the best with our people, with our staff, with our clients. So uh, I hope you enjoy. Give a listen. All right, here we go. Another episode, the second episode of the Easton Online Podcast. Um, I'm stoked to be doing this. And man, I'm here with probably, I got a couple best friends. Uh, but yeah, I'm here with one of them. Mike, what up, man? Mike Tusik. What up, dude? Thanks hey, for having me, Elliot. We're popping your cherry, huh? Popping my cherry. First time. I have to First be time. in the public eye. Oh, you don't like it, do You're you? You're taking me from behind the curtains yes. and pulling me out. I'm sorry. I know, I know you like behind the curtains a little better, but uh, man, so where do we start this journey with you, Mike? Like you were, okay, so everyone was a student first, including me, right? Every, like there's no been very little outside hiring. Very little successful outside hiring. Okay, there's and been me. outside hiring. There's been very little successful and outside each hiring. each time. And now we just don't do it anymore, really. Super rare. We may do it for this one thing coming up here, but what? we're still undecided on that. Okay. What's that? That HR rep. Oh, the HR. Yeah, we don't really have any good HR. Yeah, like, like, we don't have that. But we're going to train somebody from within, so I think this band-aid will help for now. Right. So, I mean, that's a, that's a we could start right there. Like, just that, not, not the HR. But, um, yeah, we can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're hiring an HR, because we can't we trust can't. Elliot and ourselves. Yeah, because Mike and I just get too hot, and then, look, this is a good place to talk. Part of business is doing what you love, finding it so it's finding to make it so that you love it. Like you don't like the front of the house, right? Like we just like, that's what we just said. I, I brought you into the public eye. You're all nervous over here looking and I do, you know, I yeah, do. We each have our, our roles to play. Just right. like when we pulled out those uh, cards with Larry Dressler, right? Mm -hmm. If you guys ever need a business consultant, he is the man. I'm going to get Larry on the podcast. Oh my God. Yeah, he's, he's unbelievable. Amazing. He's amazing. But we pulled out those cards, right? Yep. Remember then, like, we had to choose where we stood. Yes. And, uh, you know, everybody, like, pulled right away. We knew what Elliot's card was. Yes. Evangelist. <laughs> it was like, boom, there he is. Good thing if he was a religious leader, we'd know where he'd fit. <laughs> you guys better hope I don't find Jesus, man. <laughs> you know, we, we do worry about it, but it would be entertaining. It would be entertaining. It would be entertaining. <laughs> we'd be praying before every meeting. Yes. So. But we, we had a mall as the, the cultural compass, right. which is very, I think, uh, on point. On point. Yes. You know? Yes. He was the first guest. He was the first guest. Yeah. Reason for that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Like, and uh, so we're, we're both in the same business. We teach martial arts. We teach jujitsu. We teach Muay Thai, kickboxing. That's our business. But like we have way different roles for a little bit what you enjoy, a little bit what I enjoy and what keeps us happy. And the reason that we're getting rid of it for going to find an HR person is because it's pushing us over the edge, right? It's, it's, it's making us like almost hate the work. Yeah. The HR is, uh, I think it's important. We always have that human element in business. Like we want to deal with every problem the best we can, uh, and finding a solution for it. But sometimes we have to admit our, our weak part, our weak spots. And you know, with legal things, we can spend time on the phone with attorneys, but at the end of the day, it'd be good to have somebody in house that we can reference to help us with, you know, things that don't make our life fun. Cause we want to have our life to be fun. Yeah. Like that's, that's important to us. The grind is way better when you're enjoying it. Yeah, man. I will work from 4 a.m. till 10 p.m. every day if I'm enjoying it. If I'm not enjoying it, I'm a terrible person to be around. Yeah. I mean, and then it's, it's not good for the company. It's not good for any of us. No. You know? um, so, yeah, with the HR thing, right? Like it just gets tiresome. Like, it gets what, tiresome. you know, it gets tiresome because the easy ones we can handle a little bit, you know, but the ones that are drawn out where you need two lawyers on the phone, if you're going to like, um, like HR is way cheaper than a lawyer. Our lawyer is one of our black belts. Um, and we don't get any discounts. He usually actually adds another attorney on the phone yeah. to make sure we're getting double charged, but it's great. He's super helpful. He's super helpful. Like it, it's worth it. It's totally worth it. You need it. You know, good accountant, good attorney in business. Let's, you know, you, and, and, and hopefully it looks like we're going to need good HR <laughs> <laughs> with Elliot and me here. It's probably important. I know, you, I, I know you hate when I say this, Mike, but if anybody's going to bring this thing down, it's going to be me or you. It's I know <laughs> I, that's why I hang out behind the curtains. If I'm behind the curtains, it's very hard it's for hard me to bring, bring it, down. it down. 
So right. I don't have the uh, ability to stay as even keel as you in, in, in a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. So what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about uh, business? We're here what? to talk about business. Yeah. What, uh, when did you, so you started with us as the manager of Boulder. First you were a student. Yeah, and man. Then so the, for then sure. you were the manager of, of Boulder. Amal brought you in when uh, Tony opened his own school. Something um, like that. Something like that. I wouldn't say he opened his own school. I think he still has a nut on that. Um, and you were managing Abel's Pizza. Yeah. So I came to Colorado because uh, I was just a fuck up most of my life in as far as like staying, you know, in line with what society needed me to do. <laughs> Meaning I didn't do well in school because I would get in trouble a lot because I couldn't pay attention. Right. And I think this is an important part of uh, yeah. if you read any business books, like you read about some leaders or some great CEOs or founders, you read about their schooling. And a lot of time you find, not that I'm this person, but a lot of times you find that they had a hard time conforming to uh, school and education. And if you look back on education, it's pretty obvious how it was like put together, you know, it was like built off to the, off the robber barons, right? And they set up schools so they would create factory workers, right? So it was like getting people comfortable conforming so that they could put them into a factory line of work. So that you could just work for, work for somebody. So you could just work for somebody. Right. And you find, and I know a lot of people that I came up with, that I grew up with that, um, were like me and they're usually, most of them are pretty successful now. And the ones that were getting straight A's, and I've done a lot of research on this as well, but I look back in my own history and there's nothing wrong with this, but they're working for somebody um, and they're, and which is not wrong either, but I know they crushed it in school and they had these high expectations uh, to do all these things uh, with their careers. And they ended up just finding a job and working for somebody um, that was probably more like me or more like Elliot. And it's interesting to see how that changed. I mean, I got good grades in school. Me too. I got A's and B's. Okay. But I was a nightmare. I wasn't. My parents were educators. So mm. it was like, I mean, I can remember the first time I got a bad grade and like something went wrong, like at school, my mom, my, they, I mean, my mom didn't talk to me for a week. <laughs> like I'd be up, I had to come home and this was, I had to come home, go upstairs in my room. And then like, uh, I would just randomly walk downstairs at like six o'clock and they'd all be eating dinner. <laughs> you know, like I wouldn't, they weren't even telling me when dinner was. So, uh, I don't know. I'm a pleaser a little bit. Like I think so. Yeah. I was like, okay, I'm never going to let that happen again. Yeah, right? that's true. Where like, I think just, that's just my, my DNA where I think other people are like, well, fuck you. You, you you're know? not a pleaser now though no because I, 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 I rebelled against that you I rebelled did it, eventually I, you know it's like I realized like through when, like when I had my breakdown that I was just trying to please everyone this is part of it you know I was like, trying to always make my mom happy always make my wife happy follow the rules and yeah you know and things like that and even though I know I had I didn't have a very pleasing career like I fought but in my mind I started to keep these couple people happy and and that drove me over the edge yeah. You know? And that's, that's, I mean, I think it's important to work for somebody that you love and that you care about and that cares about you. Yeah. Uh, but for me, yeah. So like just dialing back there so we can catch up to the Easton piece. Cause I'm sure people don't need to hear my backstory, but no, I, we do. I think it can be important. No, 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 no. We do. Uh, but for me, like I, I finally found like uh, sports in, in high school and I, and I loved football cause I was not very skilled. I was like 150 pounds and I w couldn't touch a ball. I couldn't catch a ball. But then they finally were like, oh, Mike, sophomore year, let's put you as a nose guard on defensive line at 150 pounds. And I was like, cool, I'll do that, whatever. And first play, first varsity game, uh, <laughs> lights, they put me down, and I sacked the quarterback first play of my first varsity game. And so I was like, whoa. <laughs> so Mike makes people cry, let's understand, at all athletic endeavors. Um, like if he, like we started CrossFit at the gym for a little while, right? And you're like, ah, whatever, whatever. And you had all these CrossFitters coming in that like wanted to go to the games. Uh, and they're like, this was their hope. And they were like looking at their numbers compared to other people. And they're like, they were ca they were catching some people that were like in the CrossFit games. So just this is just so you guys get an understanding of Mike. And Mike started and within three weeks, he had the same numbers as everybody else. Like, he, you know, he's 150 pounds, deadlifting 500. Well, I'm, like, 18, I'm 170 now. Okay, but. sure. He's 170 <laughs> now. Okay. Big, big change. Big difference. In sophomore year. Big difference. 20 pounds, right? He uh, He's had a torn ACL for, I think, three years now, can barely train. He's got a 10 pack. So, I mean, like, just understand when Mike says he's not 
strong enough, like he's a freak athletically. <laughs> So then I finally found my place in football and it was great. And I just, my only job, which I, something finally clicked for me for the first time in my life. The school I could do, but I was always in trouble. Like I hated out of school three times from kindergarten <clears throat> to second grade. I had to go to three different schools back and forth, right? Because that's how I couldn't pay attention. Uh, then I found football and I was like, oh, I just have to tackle that guy and hurt him as hard as I like, just, just kill him. I can do that. And that, that it was so simple to me. Just make that click, like tackle that person every time. Got it. No problem. So then I did that. And then, you know, eventually, you know, I'm 21 years old. I run into this person, Ian Lieberman, who's one of our general managers. And uh, <laughs> who's another one of our best friends. Exactly. So he brings me into Easton. And I was like, man, this is fun. And Elliot was there, this big, loud personality <laughs> who, uh, you know, he would shame us. But I was used to that from sports. And it was a pretty powerful experience for me. And from then on out, it was like day one. I was like, this is what I'm doing the rest of my life. I'm going to own a school. And it was, it's been a cool journey. It's been a great journey. And then, you know, I went to Brazil for a bit, competed a bunch throughout that time. I got back from Brazil and my hiatus on life at like 28 years old. And Amal offered me the job and I walked into the office and he was interviewing me uh, and two other people. Was one of them Tor? No, it was I myself, Ian. James and Max. Max? Uh, he's one of our students still now. All right. I don't remember. Anyway, I get back. He's in the office with this consultant I, we hired. I remember him. T I remember talking to him about this. And I walked in the office and the first thing I said, you're a fucking idiot if you hire anybody else but me. <laughs> I'm like, all right, you have the job. So that works sometimes. Okay. <laughs> so this is what I did on the ultimate fighter. This is how I got on the ultimate fighter. The same exact thing. I walked, the, they're doing the interview process and you walk into the room and man, they gave us $30 to like for a per diem in Vegas, right? Like what, what the fuck is that going to get you? <laughs> you know? And this is before you're locked away, right? Like you can still go do whatever you want. And I walk in there and they have this fucking spread, like this delicious spread of food. And I walk in and I look at the, <clears throat> the producer and I go, what the fuck, man? You give me $30 and you have all this? I was like, you fucking kidding me? And that was, I was good. Done. Right there. Like, this guy is going to be entertaining. And then I was boring as fuck on the show. <laughs> and he was boring. <laughs> uh, but you were going through some tough times then. Yeah, but I wasn't... Um, that show isn't my personality, right? Like, I need, like, true human, like like real interaction not with like these fake people and, and you weren't best friends with the enemy yet yeah no. that was a big that was a big part part yeah, of it that was a big part <laughs> no it was you know and we, we talked about this the other night um so you were managing abos that, Manage that was your oh, job that's right at 21 i took over as a manager of abos a pizza place pizza and, place and i did that for seven years first time managing uh so no training no management skills no nothing no i just been in sports as a captain of like the football team right. for like three years okay and but that's that about yeah, it and wrestling but that's like some popularity a little bit too yeah, you, yeah. totally so and if you're good yeah you know like the, exactly the, the best totally. player on the team is the yeah. captain i learned general. i learned jack shit i was just an yeah. asshole you're just, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> to be honest i can look back and be like yeah i got all these leadership skills yeah there were some great people like a couple coaches that i kind of shaped me about like what it was like to actually care about somebody right. and i think that is what uh taught us about management like what is management man it's really just like caring about the people you know people first and once you can like really solidify that everything else is easy because you know you want to be cared about people want to be cared about and you realize that and you can pretty much move forward with any challenge yeah yeah i mean um the the people part of it you know where what made me, I would say, as close to you as I think we are now is when, uh, early on in my struggle, um, you said something. I was sitting on my front porch. I, I, I wrote about it in my book, too. I remember. You know, you were sitting on my front porch. I was crying. I mean, I was sitting on my, we were on the phone. I was crying. And you started to cry a little bit. And you said, this is just get to get to the people part, portion of it. You were like, look, man, I would die for a lot of people. But there's very few people I would kill somebody for, and I would fucking kill someone for you. So, and that I think was a big moment. I, I would even say it's a, it was a big moment for Easton. You know, like I would say, like because we knew that we were going to run through this together. You know, like life and and all of it. And I would say of all the things that's made us successful, I think it's just that we are really close, like the core unit. I think I think a key thing here is is like this. I'm not some fucking altruistic person that's like trying to say I'm some white knight. I don't believe that shit, no. right? Yeah. But what I do believe is that it's important to be a good person, man. If and like Elliot talks about this a lot, and I think 
any great leader, any great person, any good person talks about being a good person. What does that mean? Man, if something shitty happens, you're going to run out there and try to save that person, even at the expense of your own life. Because that's like what good people do. It's not about being a white knight or Mm. being special or posting about it everywhere. It's about just doing the right fucking thing. There was was a post Henzo made yesterday. I talked to, I told Jordan about it, like principles. I think we're very principled. Yeah. Values are really key. Values are really key. And Henzo made a post. He was like, man, this is a, he took a picture of his lawyer and he's like, man, this guy's suing me for $5,000. You know, and we're so we're sitting down. He's having conversations. Him, his lawyer, the guy, and the guy's lawyer that's suing. You know, for injury at the school. Um, and Henzo's lawyer gets the guy to agree to a settlement of two fifty. You know, from five thousand. And then they look at him and go, "And now we're not going to pay you a penny. Now, <laughs> now we're going to go to trial, and I'm going to spend more at trial than you are than than I would on this two fifty. Because of the principle, because of the values that I stand with and that I won't move on. And I think, I think that's one of the big things that we got to. Yeah, man. The values have been a really difficult thing. I talk to them a lot with other businesses, not just jujitsu. Jiu-Jitsu was the catalyst for all of this. But values are... Man, we know our core values. Like, we, we, if you think and look at yourself just for a few hours, you can really figure out what your values are, mm-hmm. right? But it's a whole other thing to, like, put those values out there for the world to see. Because once you put your values out there, you have to fucking stand by those or you're a fake. You're fake. And, you know, I, I journal whenever I can, especially when I'm having a hard time. And I, and I feel that when I rewrite down the values, like, man, I will fucking do anything to stick to this. So this decision that is hard and is going to hurt, it's... I put those values out there and it's important I stand by those. I'm not going to falter anymore. No. And look, you fuck up on your values. We all do. Of but, course. But when, but when you have them, you can go, oh, like as soon as you realize you fucked up on them, like you fuck up on them all the time. I fuck up on them all the time. We got to talk like, you know, every six months, hey, office for one of us, right? But we misstep. There's a difference yeah. between a misstep True. and then a complete blatant disregard. It's like yes. jaywalking versus like a hit and run. Right. right? Yeah, like good way we to do put some it. jaywalking occasionally. Yeah. You know, it just happens. We're and humans. then we're like, we're oh, yeah. we got to fix that. And we notice that. it. Yeah. We talk about it. It's when people in the organization, including ourselves, uh, if somebody like decides to do a hit and run, you know, if they do really break the core values, man, it's fucking over. And, uh, that's that is the key. This is what changed Easton. Like we've done a lot since since I was managing Boulder and trying to figure out how to do these like run the school. Mm-hmm. I just read book after book. Um, we'll get into this some of the books you read in a second, but keep going. Yeah. So like managing a school and man, I made so many mistakes and I look back now from a year ago on how many mistakes I was making. I'm gonna do the same thing next year. Like fuck, I made a lot of mistakes. But managing the school um, to. Just bolded to make it as great as it could be, right? And it blew up. We did amazing things there by like just, we can get into like all the systems and how that changed. But I think what's really important is like the past two year journey for Easton. I think that is the most valuable thing we can share on this podcast for anybody that that, ha- that is in this journey with business because we've failed so much over the past 20 years. And the past two years, man, it is fucking unbelievable. Like the connection, the cohesion, the transparency that is happening amongst the organization. So one of the Denver students asked me the other day, uh, Amy Fidelis, mm-hmm. you know, she asked me, she was like, man, like, look at this. It's July. Because normally we're talking, you're talking dead, right? Like yeah. two, three years ago, July at the Denver school, empty. Yeah. Empty. Right? Like completely empty, like five people, 10 people in a class wondering like, fuck, what's going to happen? God, August, the end of August needs to get here so that people start, you know, like, and now, I mean, we're packed. And she was like, what, what, what do you think it is? And I was like, oh, it's simple. I was like, we just, we just have a culture. We have a community. We have, we have a culture in the school. And now, now that the culture is so established that it's so ingrained in everyone top down now you can go work on the actual things that the business needs to like actually grow yeah exactly like it, and it's so much easier it's so easy it's so much easier yeah it's so easy you know and, and it's and it's reading that got us there right like like it's just <laughs> yeah like I, I don't know mark twain's quote maybe maybe jordan could pull it up jordan but it's mark twain quote the one jamie. where he talks about <laughs> jamie <laughs> the one where he talks about uh you know uh, i think everything is plagiarism or all great things are, are plagiarized mm. i don't i don't know the exact quote but it's true like i was talking to alex huddleston earlier one of our black belts uh that just moved up to 
uh, Boulder, very intelligent individual, very insightful. And I've been using a lot of the words he uses lately because I like how they're cleaner and not, um, I don't know, they don't bring people down. And I'm like, man, I steal from you all the time. He's like, man, I'm just stealing this shit from other gurus, man. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, and I love that. And it's okay to, to do that. And it's, and it's been really powerful for us. It, it goes back to the same thing as there's no such thing as self-made. Yeah. No, man. It's fucking luck. It's, Education. Yeah. Grit. We, you, look, for me, like I, I have a delineation point in my life. I have a very clear delineation point. And um, the two people that got me through, the I, three actually, the three people that really got me through it were you, Will, and Ian. Will and Ian are brothers, by the but, way. Yeah, Good they're figure. brothers, you know? So you guys are the three guys that I would say 70% of the time were like in my life, were like talking to me through the night, you know, and we can talk about that story. Go to the gospel fire, you know, um, but you, so, but I had nothing to do with that. You guys just happened to walk into the fucking school when I was like trying to be a pro fighter 10 years ago, whenever that, I don't even, whenever that was like, I didn't make that in my life. And now I'm like way over here down this like different path. But you in my, like, man, I'd. I made my life. Are you fucking kidding? me? Yeah, man. It's back to that. The <laughs> video you just showed me like, yeah, uh, don't be a victim, man. Like once you fucking remove that victim mentality from your mind and it's hard to do, man, that woe is me. Mm. Those, 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 those FOMO and that FOBLO shit. Like yeah. fear of missing out, fear of being left out. You got to leave that shit behind, man. Like that, that thing that another, another great piece of wisdom from Huddleston, right? Was he's like for communities, like, man, you have to, community is about participation, not invitation. Mm -hmm. And like, man, when you're sitting at home feeling left out and down on yourself, like this is what it was in high school, right? Or because you didn't get invited to that party. Right. Or now if you're missing something, you think the person intentionally left you out? No, man, they're just busy with their own life. You know, remember there's perspectives. Remember there's like, leave that inner dialogue behind and be a part of something. And the same thing with the fear of missing out and all, and all of that stuff. Like, don't just don't think you're so great. Right, you didn't create this, right? Like you, like it, it, it wasn't all you. But I think there's two, like you, you have people have FOMO, right? And then they're like, oh, look at me. I don't have FOMO. I'm the one who made all of this. So look, it's it's somewhere right in the middle. Yeah, man. Right? Balance, right? Balance. That yeah. book I want to write one day. It's gonna call be balance. I, I can say this on here, right? Balance. Don't be a pussy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, so I mean, like when we're talking, like <laughs> this is how we are. Like when I talk to the HR lady, you know, like we uh, gotta give him a heads up. Yeah, I I told her I was like, did you did you talk to her again afterwards? I have not yet. Okay, so I told her I was like, look, you gotta understand, like we aren't like my biggest. F I I like went the other way with her when I spoke with her. Like I was like, look, we need HR, but understand who we are. We curse, right? We play rap music. Um, I I am. I like, you know, a micro, I micro aggress, verge on macro aggress all day. No, no, you're misunderstanding. He doesn't okay. micro aggress at all. He is straight a fuck. He's a Mack truck aggressor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is better. It's in, it's in, it's a truth versus yeah. like this hidden aggression. Yeah. It's not hidden at all. So under like people are cursing in the school, um, like, you know, not at four o'clock when the kids are around, but I was like, but understand like we hit each other. We're, this is a, we're fighting basically, you know, and, and we're teaching people how to fight. So understand when we talk about HR, like we were earlier, she's got to understand who, who we are here. You know, who I feel we like are. if we continue, we will just go on tangents all day long yeah. talking. I don't know if we should stick to some stuff, but I'm happy to keep continuing this conversation. Homie. You want me to put that homie, away? You okay, put that cool. away. We'll get there. Got it. Look, you Got can't. Th this is this is when podcasting goes bad. <laughs> when okay? you try to go to a script. When you go, okay, now I am supposed to ask Michael Tusk now. When you first started <laughs> managing Easton, what was a typical day in the life of Mike Tusk not like, right? This is, this is how you end up with like a hundred listeners. And like when you get to 110, you're like, yes. You're, you're my podcast guru, bro. Yeah, I get well, it. So I just follow Rogan. I talk <laughs> about it all the time. I just follow Rogan. You sit down. Like I won't talk to people about like when people ask me what they like, what, what are we going to talk about? I was like, I don't know. They're like, can I get a heads up? I'm like, uh, we're gonna talk about your life, and like, like more. I was like, no, no, no I, I can't do that. Like, I, I can't script. I was like, is there anything you don't want me to talk about? How about that? And if they say they don't want me to talk about something, then I, I avoid that. But you can't, 
you know, I, I have some rough ideas, man. I'm looking at the screen. Oh yeah. Oh, they're right there. Yeah, okay, I have cool. them right here, man. I don't want people to get bored with my with the story, but I think no, it's pretty this funny. Is, this is where it's at. <laughs> the, the gold the gold is this kind of stuff. Dude, come on, Mike. How many books how many books are written on business? I don't know. Millions probably. Millions, right? Millions. You know? But the problem with the book and the problem with like a news clip, and this is why podcasting is great in my opinion, is that you can't get the story behind someone. You have like this little section. You know, like when if even in an even in a in an interview on TV, like it gets edited and you don't really know what that person really said. The long form podcast is gone is the way to go because they can be like, damn, they get attached to you. It fleshes it out. It flesh. Yeah. Like you can say something a little bad and then and but then they can listen to the whole thing and be like, ah, I see his point. So I want to talk about that real quickly. Okay. So there's my my wife. I fucking love her dearly. We're we're very you know we're opposite in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, she works out like a fiend. Like it's amazing, uh, <laughs> and uh, I love that she works out a lot. Um, but we we argue a lot. She's she's smarter than I am. She like is great academically. Like she goes to school and she just crushes it whenever she decides to go back to school, <laughs> which is <laughs> you know it happens here and there. <laughs> uh, it's another story. But she's really good at school. She's really good at critical thinking. She's really good at like reading stuff. And I think I want to talk about critical thinking a little bit. Yeah. And I think this is really important to discuss when you're running a business, when you're leading people, shit, when you're reading a book, when you're walking through life. If you don't have the ability. To to critical think. Um, I think this is why um, ideology, like uh, religious literature, can be dangerous, right? Like, if somebody doesn't have like an education or is never taught how to critically think, they will read something and take it as the gospel, right? They don't realize you can pull some great things out of everything. I know there's another quote in like Buddhism, right? That talks about um, always be learning, right? Or like have a white belt mind or have beginner's mind. So I read a lot and some of it is shit, but I tell you every time I read something, I learn so much and I can take the stuff that works. I can try it on and I'm like, cool, this works. I'm going to keep using and it. And you get your mind changed. Yeah. And then I, I can try it out. Just be an open mind. I was not like this five years ago, yeah. um, but I, I do stress about people listening to just one podcast person or just listening to one guru, right? Right. Because they're believing this person is a fucking God, a sage, whatever, whatever you whatever you want to call it. And they're not experiencing anything else. Like in my bathroom, I have this whole let's talk about this real quickly. I have this routine that I tr stick to 90 percent of the time because it's like self work and it's really important. And I recommend everybody giving this a shot. Like there's plenty of different routines, but they do help. Um, mine has been fleshed out over the past few years. And man, I wake up. 4.30 or 6, depending on if I have a late night meetings or not. I get out of bed, and first thing I do is I turn the coffee maker on, the espresso machine now that Elliot gave me. Thanks, Elliot. It's amazing. And then I go meditate for 10 minutes with the Sam Harris podcast every single time, the Waking Up podcast. Um, after that meditation happens, I make my coffee, and then I read for 25, 30 minutes. And the reading, it's very important what I read. It's more uh, intense technical reading. It's actually right now, the book I'm reading is Chet Richards. He was a... Uh, uh, acolyte of John Boyd, another great person. But um, Jordan gave me this book and it's it's more technical. Like he's like a mathematician and I can read it in the morning because I'm really fucking caffeinated. I'm centered. Nothing's bothering me yet. So I get my reading in, I journal, and then I get on my computer and I work like for two hours. At 8 a.m. I take my kid for two hours to give my wife some free time. And then at 10, it's fucking on. Like all the hard work's done now. 10 a.m. to 4 or 5 p.m. I am just hanging out with Easton people, just working, getting to know people, dealing with meetings, people problems. And I always end my night with, um, oh, hold on, in there, I drive a lot. So I have a book I'm listening to audioly. This is important. I think it's it's a book that's either kind of lighter business stuff or it's a memoir, something that's cool about a human being, uh, a biography like Team of Rivals by um, uh, about Lincoln. And then at night, it's a, bi a biography, like something that I can really get into. Um, and go to bed and listen to that. You're doing some World War II stuff, weren't you? At night? So, oh man, we can get into this shit. Man, I fucking love. So this is this is the cool thing. So when you read, what happens is we read a lot. You start going down these rabbit holes and you find these things that interest you. And you can start this morning. I really traced some shit back, which was interesting. So my bath might keep another kind of reading. I keep philosophy and religious reading or like the art of war because you, you can't sit down and read those kind of books. You can read like a page or two at a time, really absorb them while you're taking your morning dump. It's a, it's a great bathroom reading. So for me, for me, like I don't push my coffee machine. <laughs> Dude, why are you pushing the button on that? I got to turn it on. Oh, no. What do you mean? I didn't show you this. Oh, it's got an automatic turn on feature. 
Oh, that's okay. I changed my time to wake up. It takes. It's ready by the time I'm done meditating. Okay, so, so you don't mind. It's, it's, okay. it's perfect. It's all calculated. All right, right. no worries. I mean, so <laughs> I, like I, I, I take a dump first and then meditate. That's how uh, I do it. I need my coffee before I dump. Yeah. So no, I don't. Just, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, but the so anyway, I was reading. I this actually fucking Jordan again sparked some of this World War II stuff. I read this stuff about this John Boyd character, and he gets really into military strategy. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, so I started watching a lot more about, you know, war, like the Civil War, World War II, finding it pretty interesting, learning about Blitzkrieg and like creating the fog of war. Uh, and I like the idea of strategy. It's really cool. So I kept learning more. And then everything you read goes back to uh, uh, Sun Tzu, right? The Art of War. Am I saying that right, Sun Tzu? Mm -hmm. uh, the Art of War. And then I'm reading The Art of War this morning and Art of War traces back all the way to Taoism, right? So it's... It, it's so far back and it's so simple. What it does though, like look, you're, you're, you're World War II that has nothing to do with our business. Not, but, but it does. Oh, it does, Everything right? does. Everything does. Like, because it just, like you were saying, it gets you down these rabbit holes and then you're like, oh, and then I can take this and I can put it there and you know, just the idea, the, the idea that you're constantly changing and you're constantly evolving more and and new information is constantly coming in your mind from this person over here and from that person over here and from somebody I might disagree with. Yes. You know, like I go back to him all the time, Jordan Peterson. I can't figure out whether I like the guy or hate the guy or, or, or what it is, but I love listening to him because he makes me think critically. I don't want to say I hate any of them. That's the thing. Yeah. I'm like, I'm stoked these motherfuckers will put some time in and wrote these thoughts uh -huh, out. Uh -huh. Right? And I don't I disagree or agree. There's still wisdom in there. Yeah. And like, so I have a, I have a you, know, you know, I don't like labeling mentors, but there's a person in my life that definitely helped me see some of this stuff. And you look at, uh, do you guys know who Charles Munger is or you know who Warren Buffett is, right? Charles right. Munger is like second in command. Charles Munger is like 92, 94. Uh, Buffett is like 88. And these guys are fucking with it. 100% with it. My grandfather was not very with it at 80. My grandfather was with it until the day he died. So my, these two people, they fucking read voraciously. They're constantly working their mind and it improves their memory. It improves improves their business. Like there's a reason they're worth billions of dollars and right. they're extremely, you know, they're pretty happy people that yeah, influence the yeah. world. And it's it all stems back to reading. Like it's just nonstop reading because you get to learn about the human condition. And I don't give a fuck what you're reading. I used to read only fantasy. Now when I go back and want to read fantasy, man, I'll read about a king some author wrote about in his fucking fantasy book. And I pull so much. I'm, I'm going to use that today in my speech or I'm going to talk yeah. to the leaders about that. There's so much, you know, there's so much. Um, so I don't just read. Like oh, I listen to audio too. So I'm, I'm just saying I don't just do the book thing because I'm doing this, the digital marketing stuff, right? Like the Eastern, like for this podcast, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to, so I have to watch some, I have to watch a lot on YouTube. Yeah. Right. Like I have to watch how people do things and I, and I, and it's not reading, so it's not quite the same, but it's, it's just information gathering you know, in my opinion, it's just information gathering from, from this source or that source. I'm like, Oh, and then you like go down the rabbit hole with that person, you know, like Amy Porterfield, like I bought her, like she's the one who for show who's that's the course I took for the digital marketing, you know, to make a digital course. And then she's got this list builders course. And now we're, I bought that. And now Jordan and I are watching going and going through that. And now who know? I mean, and I don't even care. I don't even care that I have to spend money on some of the stuff, but it's like, yeah, I want to do the, uh, uh, oh, Dude, yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't the, matter. The ROI on your fucking on learning is unbelievable. And yes, I read a lot because I set my life up so I can. And because I'm in a cool position now where there's amazing people in the company, we can get to the structure. I think this is really important, but I get to read a lot so I can think about working on the business. We're going to have to do another podcast the on the structure because we're almost done. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, like an only, only la a podcast, you can only go so long. Um, yeah. So, but I, so I think that's a, that's an important piece. Then let's just say that for a minute, that education piece. I don't yeah. think it has to be reading, right? Like I read the wall street journal, but I also read a bunch of just articles all the time. You uh -huh. have to be constantly in taking education because again, back to what we first talked about, it's about the people, right? And how do you understand people? You have to learn about the human condition. How do you learn about the human condition? You have to be open to every piece of information that comes your way and you got to think about it and you can read about it. You can fucking write about it. You can talk on Voxer for hours with different people about it. You can have meetings, you can do pot, whatever it is, as long as you're open to intake information constantly, you can understand the human condition and then you can really help manage people. Uh, I have a hard time with the word lead people. Uh, I feel like 
I don't know. Maybe it's this. It creates uh, the guru thing. It's yeah. It's maybe this is Stockholm syndrome where I'm worried that uh, I'm not good enough and I shouldn't be saying those things. Dude, I it's all I, I talk to my therapist about. <laughs> you know, I talk to my therapist to therapist about like four things: uh, my wife, my mom, uh, and leadership. And like, God damn, I can't be seen as someone's guru. I can't be this leader. Like, I'm that. Da- I get like. Not that I can't because I want to be. I want I want to inspire. I don't want the fucking label. I don't want the label. I don't want the people to look at me like I'm unflawed. <laughs> because, He's fucking flawed. Because God damn am I flawed. thing with Elliot is you see Elliot one, one Elliot, but Elliot's his big old teddy bear. Mm. I'm going to break your... Uh, your persona. No, it's your- okay. It's not what I want. Like I, this, like Anna and I had to go through this. Yeah. Like, because like years ago, like two years ago, she was so like standoffish a little bit, but I could tell that she like loved me, you know? And I'm like, look, what do you, what they do know you know who Anna is? Uh, Anna, it doesn't matter. Anna's okay. one of my, Anna's like my ninja student. Like I fucking love her little girl. I'm going to bust his balls real quick. I make yeah. fun of him a lot when he okay. says my student too. Oh no, she's you're all mine. <laughs> you, see, you're not on social media. I gave this great post about my students. Uh, that's another thing I got off social media so I could read I more. I, you're all mine. Every <laughs> single one. all you. his. Yeah, and I don't know how you possess a person. You know, and I wrote this. That's what I said. I was like, I'm not sure if possession is okay. You know? <laughs> this is a coming from a black Jew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody can discuss this, it's you. It's me. I know. I I, I get passes everywhere I go just about, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I, you don't, I'm, I'm a white guy. I don't get passes. Yeah, I, know. I don't deserve them. Yeah. So uh, now you guys are everyone's mine. Amal's my teacher, even though he's above me, right? And so I. So if you can't, so what he's saying is, guys, if you can't beat that whole ownership thing, he's gonna fucking embrace it. Is what he's yeah. getting at. <laughs> yeah, I, I do, I do. <laughs> I respect that. You know, I'm glad I heard this. Like, I, I feel like everyone's mine. That's my wife. Those are my kids, and I can't like tell you what to do or any of that. That's not what I'm saying. But goddamn, there, there's a like, uh, there's a piece of every person that is in my life that when I say mine, it attaches love to them, for me. You know? Yeah. And not like I can tell them what to do. I'm not, like I said, I just want to, and I, and I know where this goes bad too. I know it's a fucking slippery slope. I'm I, I got to comment on this. You know? I know, but give me a second. <laughs> I'm not, you know? Yeah, go ahead and finish. But they, I, I, uh, it, it's, I think they know I love them. I so hope they do. Yes. Yes. The people that are close to Elliot that he calls mine for the most part, know he loves them, right? Like, I know he loves me. When he tells me he's my boss, it first pisses me off sometimes. I'm like, it's cool. I know Elliot has good intentions. When's the last time I told you I'm you your ha- boss? You haven't in a while, but okay. I'm just bringing that up. All right. Uh, but it's it's the collateral damage that I would say is when it can be dangerous. Mm-hmm. And this is where we talk about Elliot's an evangelist and he's on the stage promoting Easton and, and making helping like show what we're trying to do to the world. Uh, and I'm behind the curtains because I don't trust the things that come out of my mouth because I can see there can be collateral damage with with uh, words. And Elliot is a big personality. And when he's giving this speech and the people in the room that love him and trust him implicitly because he deserves to be because he's an amazing person uh, will be like, I get what he's saying, man. He's the man. But when there's somebody on the kickboxing mat 100 feet away, like, who is this big, scary guy over there yelling? I don't want to come back. <laughs> you want to know what I did yesterday? <laughs> Are you ready? So that's where we're trying to find yeah, out the balance we're trying to there. Find that Again, balance. there's it's that hard. word. You want to know what I did yesterday? Always. All right. So I walked into the... Do I, I actually? Is that the right I don't know. Answer? We'll see. We've, we've had this discussion before and we've never got known where to go with it. Um, I, okay. So we live in Colorado, everyone. We're, we are in Colorado and marijuana is legal. So um, I walk into the Denver locker room and be, like uh, I had to take a piss and in between classes and it reeked, bro. It fucking reeked of weed. And you're surrounded by the by uh, grows around the yeah, yeah yeah there's there's two grows around us yeah you know but it wasn't that somebody either walked in and smoked or was smoking something like yeah. that right and I was like you know Dude, what I man? work at the Boulder gym a lot I know. I know so I was not so and, and uh, I'll be clear I'm I'm not afraid to say I like to smoke some weed sometimes especially like like last night for example I come home it's nine o'clock nine thirty and um it's and I just trained for an hour. Right, an hour and a half. I've been on. I've been jacked up. I mean, if if you take my class, like, 
I don't know, man. I'm giving everything in my class. Like I, I, I am teaching the best class. I, I am not holding back. <laughs> you know, so it's a lot of energy for me. And then I train at the end of it, right? And then, like, man, it's hard for me to go to sleep. It's hard for me to come down at nine thirty at night and like get to bed before three. I drink a glass of whiskey because you know? I get too paranoid but with I, weed. So I can't. Dr- I can't drink. <laughs> yeah, right? I know. So I, I, like, I'm not wrecked. I can do everything. And I come home. I smoke a little bit. So I'm not against marijuana. You know, I don't do it every day. It's not my thing to do every day, but sorry, my ear itches. Um, but I walked in the locker room and it was terrible. And so I walked back out onto the mat and I, I bring my class together and it, it's the end of the intermediate beginning of the advance. I was like, look guys, I just want everyone to understand, um, how, how the men's locker room smells right now is not okay. And it's not body odor. It, it's, it's marijuana. And I'm not faulting you, any of you, for any of your decisions or anything like that. What you do, it's fine. I don't care. But don't bring it in here on other people. I agree, man. Like, yeah. it's the same thing when we were before marijuana was legal. If somebody yeah. came in smelling like booze, you'd be like, yeah. dude, get the fuck get out of here. And then, this then, is a martial arts academy. But you don't said, forget that. Don't forget that. Exactly. And then I walked to the kickboxing mat. And these guys don't know me that well. <laughs> I was like, hey, guys, everyone bring it in. So I, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just telling you, don't do this again. If it's you, I don't know who it is. Don't do this again. This is a place of respect and a place of honor, and you're going to treat it that way. And yes. You know? And that is a disrespectful thing to do. And that is a to disrespectful do. thing to do. It's you know? a bad tone for the it's whole class. T- for the whole school. You know, a whole, the whole school. So uh, we'll see how that went over with the kickboxing people. I think that, that's fine because yeah. you went up and talked to them. Yeah. It's when they're not hearing. It's the collateral it's, it's damage. when they're hearing me from over there. Yeah. Yeah. The, kickbo- the, it's, ki- the kickboxing program's still growing. We're all right. Yeah, we're, we're doing fine. <laughs> we're doing fine. And Ian and me are there to have the conversations with people to be like, don't worry. He's a great dude. Just stick Just around. Just get to know him. Just, Just stick, stick around. around. You'll learn. Stick around. You know? <laughs> Elliot's had to save my ass a few times. Uh, I have a pretty bad temper, so... Um, that's why I meditate so much. I have a really bad temper. Uh, and Elliot has definitely saved my ass on more than one occasion when I have definitely been out of line. So I can... Uh, yeah, I'm, happy guy, to, the, I'm happy to do the same for him. The guy who asked me if I was going to fire you, for, and I was like, are you fucking crazy? I was like, for this? You know? And I, I don't know. Maybe you would have gotten fired at other places, but no fucking way. No fucking way. You know? Are you crazy? People first. People first. And my and look, that's... I mean, so if there's any theme that is of this of the podcast and the business that we've had so far about how, how we got to where we are, it's people people let's let's talk about that real quickly because i think this will tie it in together yeah uh i think we should have another podcast discussing more of the business stuff like yeah. the structure because i think it is important it's important but you can't do it without people so this is what happened this is how this all went down uh there is without Move being closer. like uh hmm, I don't want to come off as arrogant here because that's something I always worry about when I'm speaking, but I, I live in a lot of passion when I, when I discuss these things. Okay. And with my passion, I get emotional occasionally, as Elliot knows. Yeah. Uh, I remember as a kid when I would get in fights all the time, I'd cry in the middle of a fight while I was fighting somebody. You'd be beating somebody's I'd ass be and so cry. <laughs> crying, dude. I just get emotional, man. I'm an emotional, passionate person. Um, and that comes off uh, when, when you get to know me. So when I talk about this stuff, I get really passionate. Uh, so Easton is doing really well well, right? But I always want more. Like I'm always like, not for me personally, but for the people. Uh, and what was happening is Amal, Elliot, and I are very different individuals and we all have our roles we play. Elliot, uh, Amal is the visionary. He has his own quirks and uh, I love the guy like a fucking father. Uh, Elliot is, is like a big brother to me and he's been amazing to me these past uh, years. But when I was running into this issue uh, a couple years ago where I couldn't figure out what my place was. Like I was trying to run the company for the past three or four years, but I was just the GM of Boulder. Um, and I didn't know what to do. So I was kept arguing with uh, Ella, with them all and then Elliot would like try to fix us. Yeah, like, it didn't immediate. go well. My <laughs> fix made it worse. It never worked out well. So finally I <laughs> met this guy. I was like, hey, I need help with this. He's like, you need to speak to this person, Larry Dressler. So I called Larry Dressler and I was like, man, here are my issues with these two. How do we figure it out? He's like, well, let me meet with them. And I was like, what about me? He's like, yeah, not yet. And I got Mike was so mad. <laughs> I was like, motherfucker, <laughs> I called you to fix this problem and you're ignoring me? Ooh, I, I can remember the first time I was like, oh, I just had my meeting with Larry. Mike was like, yeah, good for you. Fuck off. Hang up. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, but you have to trust the process sometime, right? Like you, sometimes you're doing jujitsu at the beginning or Muay Thai, like, why am I doing this? And then it comes full circle if you trust the person that you're trying to listen to, like trusting your teacher. So we went through this process. He met with them. They figured out, he figured out what they wanted. And then he met with all of us. Uh, it was me, Elliot, and a few other key people, Sachi, Valor, Ian, um, when we were all running the schools. We only had three main schools then. Um, we have six now. We've added three to Since the equation. Larry. Yeah. Uh, since then. So anyway, Larry kind of all the issues I was having, he didn't address it all. What he made us come up with was our vision, our right? vision and our core values and our core values. And I talked to a lot of business owners that are at that spot now when they're struggling with like what the next step is because they're working in the business every single day and they don't know how to back off to let somebody else take the reins. So Larry made us put our vision together, right? And we came with our vision and it was a lot of work. It took fucking 20 hours of meetings. Oh, more than that. Maybe more than that, right? 50, I don't know, 30 hours. It was a lot and a lot of money too. Uh, but it was, what we came up with is priceless. What's our ROI on that? Can, can you, hold on, hold on. Can you put a number on it? No. That's, yeah. <laughs> Can you put a number on it? I don't know. A million dollars. So so I so people sometimes think about everything in terms of an ROI, and uh, it's hard. I can't put a number on that, man, because yeah. this is what this did. It fixed the problems of the Ma and Elliot, right? Like they started getting what they what they got. We found out what their roles were, and then I found out what my role was, and then I got to move to the CEO and run the company with them, kind of sitting there like helping guide me and like I'm meeting with them occasionally to make this all work out. But anyway, the vision was a big piece of it. And our vision was like, what was the, the, the first iteration? It was like uh, the battle test recognized internationally yeah, as, as the, the best, the best martial, martial arts school. Art school. So I, I changed it a little bit. Elliot doesn't quite agree with this, but I moved it to make it simple and to make it so back up a little bit. What we had to come up with to help get that vision was like what our BHAGs were, like big, hairy, audacious goals. And we had a bunch of them in mind. And one that we wrote down was careers. And right, like back, let's think about what careers means. That means it's for the people, right? Like Elliot and Amal and I were doing good, but the careers are for the people, right? Yes. And then when we made that our fucking vision, like that our focus, we're like, okay, let's have 100 Easton's because what does that mean? It doesn't mean that Elliot and Amal and all of us make more money. It, yeah, sure, we're going to make more money, but we're going to make the opportunity for the same person like me who started putting stickers on a car, at East, like dri driving around Boulder, Colorado, putting st stickers on like signs for my membership to running Boulder, to running the company, to building it to 100 schools because we see all these people at Easton that like dedicated their lives to jujitsu, to martial arts. Now it'll give them the opportunity to run their own school and we're trying to create that path for them. And don't get me wrong, it's getting very competitive and it's getting harder every day and a lot of people won't be able to do it. But man, we're gonna have the opportunity for them to make this happen. So we focused on building careers for people and our vision will help get them there. And then the big caveat to that is like you can't just, you can try to get to 100 schools, but if you have no values, you will fucking burn bridges. You will make some mistakes. So the core value is something you're willing to lose friends and money over are like how you get there. You have to filter all your decisions through your core values and make sure you know where you're going with that vision. Let's, let's hear the definition of core value again. Core values, what you're willing to lose friends and money over. Simple. And it is, and you fucking better believe you it. Better, like, you better, you gotta, you gotta die on it. And we did, man. We yeah. made the biggest decision. We don't have to get into that, but it it, it, it was, we no, made man. the hardest Look, decision we've ever made in our lives, probably. There was probably four of us that were really close. You you three were even closer. We, we had to fire and kick out one of you mm -hmm. for good. And, tell, and we told this person that they don't talk to us again. And I wish the best for that person. Because I, I hope, I, I know you, you might disagree. I hope we're friends again someday. You don't have to comment on that. You know? <laughs> I won't I, comment on that. I, I hope that he gets his life together so well and, and, and makes such an impact and changes that he and I are friends again. I really hope that. And I wish him I wish him all the best. But where we are right now, can't do it. And let's talk about that too real quickly because I think it's important to note that this person, though it may have hurt, it was probably the best thing for him you know, because it was just this repeating loop, right? It's like when you have an addict in your life, you keep holding them up, right? They're never going to actually fall. And I'm not saying we did this again altruistically. This was done organically and like we decided it was the right decision for Easton. Yeah. So he's going to leave. He He's working on himself, I'm sure. But what happened was it was insane. Like 
it made a it made an people impact. looked at us and we we're like oh fuck they aren't fucking around we are not fucking around anymore and you know if you own a jujitsu school and you're like one of those new owners you have all these little things that happen and you're like ah oh, we'll just let that guy slide let that guy slide every time we've had to let somebody go that we thought would be so painful and we don't like firing people we've done like three people Ever. in like fucking 20 years <laughs> but a lot of them are recently and it's like three days of pain is what they call it. I think I got this from that book, Traction. Um, and it's three days of pain. It hurts it really bad. But three days later, your organization turns around. It I, is so powerful. People just looked at us. and because, because you can talk about core values all the time and, and all of that stuff. But when you fucking do something hard, you know, when you really fu- put, put your money where your mouth is, that that's that's when you gain some respect. That's when you that's when that's when your clients, your staff, your students, and all of that stuff. That's when they look at you and go, "Oh fuck, they're for real." And it can't be about the money, man. It's like the beauty of jujitsu. It's like the first time you touch jujitsu, right? The first time you experience jujitsu, and you're like, "Man, I'm gonna beat this person's ass." Why? Oh man, I'm tied in knots. I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, man. Jujitsu is a great metaphor for you everything. Know? Yeah, I couldn't. So, Mike, let's end it right there, man. That was amazing. That was a lot of fun, man. Uh, I really appreciate it. We're going to have to do it again about like some particulars. Yeah. But but people, you got to understand, I don't care what business you have. I don't care. I don't care what it is you're doing. If you start doing those things for money and if you start doing those things for profit and all that stuff and you aren't focused on the people and the purpose and the values and the why you will not be successful. You will not be successful. People will fucking find you People out. People will find you out. Exactly. Your, 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 your mask will be taken off. Sweet. All right, man. Thanks. That was a lot of fun, man. We'll do it again. Guys, that's it. Episode two. All done.